Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is brought to you by the StarQuest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part through the generous support of our sponsors, including Aaron Ferguson Electric and Automation at aaronv.com, A-A-R-O-N-V dot com making connections for life for your automation and smart home needs in North and Central Florida. In 1981, a group of school children in Rwanda began reporting visions of the Blessed Virgin Mary. She gave them assurances of God's love, but she also warned them that a terrible disaster that could happen. After church authorities investigated, they approved certain visions at Cabejo. These are the only African apparitions with such approval, but the church also warned about false apparitions at Cabejo. So what did Our Lady of Cabejo say? What happened after her revelations? And what do believers need to watch out for? You're listening to episode 193 of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, where we look at mysteries from the twin perspectives of faith and reason. In this episode, we're talking about the first approved apparition in Africa, the visions of Our Lady of Cabejo. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today is Jimmy Aiken. Hi, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. Folks, be sure to stay around for the end of the episode as we'll have more of your feedback on our recent episodes on Noah's Ark and the Great Flood. But first, in 1983, the three seers at Cabejo received terrifying visions of a barbaric conflict. And in the 1990s, those visions came true in the Rwandan genocide. Almost a million people lost their lives, including one of the Cabejo seers. In 2001, the Cabejo apparitions were given official church approval, making them the only apparitions in Africa to receive this status. So what happened with respect to the apparitions? Which ones are genuine, and what significance do they have for us today? That's what we'll be talking about on this episode of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. Before we get into the topic today, we want to tell you that the primary sponsor for today's episode is Amagara Marungi, a charity founded by one of our patrons, Bill and Joanna Martel. They've long worked to support a Catholic school in Uganda, and in 2021, they decided to expand their mission. As Catholic parishioners in Maine, they saw that more and more priests from Africa were coming to the United States to help make up for our present lack of priestly vocations but they also knew of the extreme need in many parts of Africa. They recognized that as African communities were, provi were providing their sons for our spiritual needs, American Catholics could show their gratitude by providing for the financial and material needs of widows, children, women, and those uniquely at risk. Their first project was funding for an ultrasound for the local health care center in Rubanda, Uganda, where an African priest in their parish comes from. Private donations, as well as support from the Knights of Columbus, purchased the machine in June and since then has been used for almost 400 patients, including 97 pregnancies. Their second project has been Mazoldi Community College, a school started by the Apostles of Jesus Religious Order to train at-risk young men in basic job skills so they can support their families and themselves. Future projects include an operating room for the health center, and with a new priest who recently arrived from Cameroon, they've started discussing with him about needs in his community. You can find out more about Amagara Marungi and their mission, and how you can join in their efforts with a donation at amagaramarungi.org or by visiting sqpn.com slash helpafrica. That's sqpn.com slash helpafrica. So that's the easy one. Yes. So, Jimmy, where were we at the end of last week's episode? We described how three schoolgirls in Cabejo began reporting visions of the Virgin Mary. The three girls were named Alphonsine, Anathalie, and Marie Claire. And huge crowds came to see them, with more than 20,000 reportedly coming to an event that was held on Sunday, August 15th, 1982. At the event, all three girls described terrifying visions that involved rivers of blood and and piles of human bodies. The message was that something like this would happen if people didn't repent, turn back to God, and act with love towards their neighbors. 
Did something like that happen immediately? Not immediately. Instead, the visions that the uh, seers were having continued for a while, but then they tapered off. In her book, Our Lady of Cabejo, Immaculee Ilibagiza reports, By the mid-1980s, some of the visionary's apparitions had ended or were becoming less frequent. Marie Claire's lasted only six months until September 1982. And Athelie's, at least her public ones, ended in late 1983. And Alphonsine received visits from Our Lady until 1989, but usually just once a year on the anniversary of their first meeting, November 28th. However, Mary and Jesus continued visiting the other seers for many months and years. As Bishop Misago later stated in his official report on the apparitions, The significant time of the apparitions ended with the year 1983, when two of the supposed visionaries of Cabejo left the podium one after another, declaring that the apparitions had finished for them. This was except for Alphonsine, the lesser frequency of whose apparitions became evident already before November 1982. Everything that happened after the year 1983 did not bring anything new compared to what had already been known, be it from the point of view of the message of Cabejo or concerning the signs of credibility. But other people were starting to report receiving visions as well. Multiple other seers started coming to Cabejo and linking themselves to the apparitions. In her book, Immaculate tells the stories of five of them, though there were others as well. Some said that they also were seeing visions of Jesus rather than Mary, and some reported very dramatic things, including seeing miracles occurring in the sky, such as the sun appearing to dance, like what was reported at Fatima in 1917, only even more dramatic. We talked about the Fatima miracle of the sun when we discussed the Fatima apparitions back in episode 40. We also discussed the famous third secret of Fatima in episodes 64 and 65, so you can go back and listen to those for more background on that. What was the attitude of the authorities toward the Cabejo revelations? The church authorities were conducting an investigation into them. Initially, this was done under the auspices of Bishop Jean-Baptiste Gahamani of the Diocese of Butare, where Cabejo was located in 1981. However, the investigation was transferred to a new diocese, the Diocese of Gikongoro, and it then fell under the auspices of Bishop Augustin Misago. Before he was bishop, Misago had been an abbot and was involved in the original investigation. In fact, as we heard last episode, he was an eyewitness of some of the events. And after he became bishop of the new diocese, um, and Cabejo was transferred to his diocese, he kept Bishop Gahamani involved in the investigation. So it was really conducted as a joint investigation by two bishops, although it would be Bishop Misago who authorized and released the final report in 2001. Bishop Misago explains how the commissions worked. Two study commissions, one of doctors and one of theologians, were immediately set up. They have been at work since April 1982. April 1982 was just five months after the apparitions began, so they were involved early on. And by 1988, the first bishop, Jean-Baptiste Gahamani, decided to take a preliminary step when approving an apparition, namely approving a devotion, often a prayer, that people could use in connection with the apparition. Approving a devotion does not mean that the apparition itself has been approved or that it's a genuine supernatural revelation, but it does mean that serious problems have not yet been found with the apparition and that the local bishop is taking an open but cautious attitude towards it. Bishop Misago explains, On August 15, 1988, Bishop Gahamanyi decided to approve a public devotion linked to the apparitions of Cabejo. Recognizing the legitimacy of this devotion, he deliberately put aside two questions whose solution was of capital importance for the future. Did the Virgin Mary and Jesus appear in Cabejo, as some alleged visionaries affirm? If so, what visionary, man or woman, can be believed in view of the large number of people who in those days began to talk about visions and messages from heaven. However, not everyone was supportive of the apparitions. You'll recall from last episode that recordings of the seers were being played on the radio, which was one of the key ways that people in Rwanda learned about them and kept up to date with them. 
But as Immaculate Ilibagiza reports, Radio Rwanda continued to air the apparitions, but the government-run station greatly reduced its coverage of Kibeho when visionaries began delivering messages critical of the extremist Hutu government's discrimination against the minority Tutsi tribe. One of their policies included limiting the number of Tutsi children like me allowed to attend federally funded high schools, which were vastly superior to private schools. Even though I had some of the highest marks in the region, my ethnic background blocked me from advancing in school and ever finding a career. So being denied access to the public education system devastated me. And this is an unfortunate reality in Rwanda. Like in many parts of the world, and like everywhere in the world until recent times, what ethnic group you're affiliated with matters. Humans naturally organize themselves into tribes based on family bloodlines, and we've been doing that ever since there have been human beings. Such social organization is built into us on a genetic level, and tribes play an important function as they allow individuals to thrive in settings where people can take on projects that are too big for any one person or one small nuclear family to do. These include building projects, growing and gathering the food needed to sustain a larger population, population, freeing up people to do specialized labor like being leaders, priests, or doctors, and of course, defending everybody against other competing tribes. Because as a result of original sin, tribes have a tendency to compete for resources, including territory and prestige, and they often do so brutally. Yes, and that's been happening since the Paleolithic, the old Stone Age, when humanity was born. Fortunately, in recent times, some humans have been lucky enough to live in societies that were able to start growing beyond single tribes and form larger cooperative structures. We see that in the Bible, for example. The nation of Israel was originally a tribal confederacy where you had a dozen tribes in a kind of loose family-based union. But even then, there was conflict between the tribes, such as when the tribe of Benjamin was almost exterminated by the men of other Israeli tribes in reprisal for a horrific act of violence, an incident that you can read about in Judges chapters 20 and 21. Or even after Saul, David, and Solomon reigned over the kingdom in a united monarchy, the ten northern tribes seceded from the two southern tribes, leading to regular tension and sometimes violence between the kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Judah. More recently, we've been able to build larger cooperative structures, even bigger ones like nation states and even international alliances. In many parts of the world, people no longer have tribal awareness, and they may have no idea what tribes their ancestors were part of and that they needed to rely on for protection. I mean, I have no idea what tribes my ancestors were part of. I just know the general parts of the world, the countries they came from. But in some places, tribal bonds are still important. That's the case here in America, where Native American groups may, may still maintain strong tribal identities. And it's also the case in many places in Africa. Immaculate Ilibagiza mentioned two ethnic groups in Rwanda, the Hutu and the Tutsis. Who are they? They're the two major ethnic groups in the country. About 84% of Rwandans are Hutu and about 15% are Tutsi. There's also another smaller group known as the Twa, who are about 1% of the population. Incidentally, the Twa are a pygmy people. So if you've ever wondered where in Africa pygmies live, Rwanda and other Central, Central African countries is where. By the way, we should stress both the Hutu and the Tutsi are broad ethnic groups, not just single small tribes. And actually, they don't neatly map across traditional tribal boundaries, and they involve other socioeconomic factors. But the history of that is too complex to go into here. However, they have experienced tension, and this became particularly sharp in the 1980s. What led to the conflict? Beginning a century earlier in the 1880s, this part of Africa was under German colonial rule and was known as German East Africa. But as a result of World War I, it became a colony of Belgium instead. Throughout this period, the local government of this particular part of German East Africa was the Kingdom of Rwanda, and the local monarchy was Tutsi, ruling over a Hutu underclass. In 1959, what's known as the Rwandan Revolution, also known as the Hutu Revolution, happened. And in 1962, Rwanda gained its independence from Belgium and became a democratic republic. 
Since the Hutu were by far the majority of the population, they won the elections and controlled the country. By the 1980s, tensions between them and the Tutsi were running high, and in 1990, the Rwandan Civil War began, and Hutu-Tutsi violence was prominent in this conflict. It continued for three years until a set of accords were signed in 1993, establishing an uneasy peace. However, on Wednesday... April 6, 1994, the Rwandan president, Juvenal Habyarimana, was flying back to the presidential residence in Kigali, the capital city. Accompanying him on the plane were the president of the neighboring nation of Burundi, as well as key military officials. And the plane was shot down. It crashed on the grounds of the presidential residence, and everybody on board was killed. Who shot down President Tabia Rimana's plane? In the wake of the assassination, it wasn't clear who was responsible. Both Hutu and Tutsi groups blamed each other. A group known as Hutu Power had been planning a genocidal final solution to exterminate the Tutsis, and in the power vacuum created by the president's assassination, they put the plan into action. The result was 100 days of terror and what has been described as the fastest genocide in history. Between April and July of 1994, hundreds of thousands of people, mostly Tutsi, were killed. Exact numbers are disputed, as they often are in cases like this, but a common mid-range estimate is that around 800,000 people were killed. Other estimates on the high end put the number above a million. Who was doing the killing? People on both sides, because once someone starts attacking you and your family, you naturally fight back. So both Hutu and Tutsi killed each other, although the Hutus had the upper hand and did most of the killing. Sometimes people were killed by the government's armed forces, sometimes by armed militias, and sometimes by their own neighbors. Some were shot, others were hacked to death with machetes, and the visionaries had seen people being hacked to death in the apparitions. Among those who were killed was the third of the seers, Marie-Claire Mukankango. She was the one who was given the mission of reintroducing the Seven Sorrows Rosary. She had promoted it in Rwanda and elsewhere, and now she met a particularly sorrowful end. Marie Claire and her husband were trapped in the capital city, Kigali, when the violence broke out. Immaculee Ilibagiza reports, Marie Claire, who'd married and moved to Kigali in 1987 to teach, ran to the aid of her husband when killers were dragging him away. The murderers then turned on Marie Claire, the feisty woman who once challenged the Holy Mother to a fist fight, and she was slain on the spot. People also were killed in Cabejo, although, again, how many isn't clear. I've seen estimates ranging from 5,000 to 25,000. Immaculee herself survived by hiding for 91 days in a 3-foot by 4-foot bathroom. Within those 12 square feet were seven other women who were hiding in the bathroom with her, being sheltered by a local pastor. Immaculee's father had told her to run to the pastor's house for protection. At one point, the pastor told them that the scale of the genocide going on outside was so great that everyone they loved was almost certainly dead. And indeed, Immaculee's family was killed in the genocide. Her father, her mother, and all of her brothers except one who was out of the country for his studies were killed. In fact, 26 members of Immaculee's broader family were killed, and she could hear the genocide as it was happening. She writes, All the weeks I hid in that bathroom, I could hear the killers searching for me every day. From where I crouched, I could hear scores of murderers being committed only yards away from me. In the squalid tiny room where those seven women and I huddled for our lives, we had no contact with the outside world. We knew only that there was a wholesale slaughter of the Tutsi tribe across the country and that we could be murdered at any moment. How did the genocide finally end? A group known as the Rwandan Patriotic Front, a Tutsi-led group, fought back and eventually established control of the country, and they've been the dominant political party ever since. Today, 
genocide ideology and divisionism are criminal offenses in Rwanda. Needless to say, the genocide left terrible scars on Rwandan society. While the country is peaceful today, this is an extremely sensitive subject. So if you ever visit, do not bring up the genocide and do not ask people whether they are Hutu or Tutsi. You may be curious as an outsider, but without detailed local knowledge, there are too many ways you could make blunders and cause serious offense by bringing up nationally sensitive subjects. If the third seer, Marie Claire, and her husband died during the violence, what happened to the other two seers in later years? According to Immaculate, Alphonsine, the first of Mary's chosen messengers, became a cloistered nun in the St. Clair convent of Abidjan the capital of the Ivory Coast, and has since moved to the Republic of Benin. She took the name Alphonsine de la Croix Glorieuse, which means Alphonsine of the Glorious Cross. And Anathali, the second of the original three seers, has remained in Cabejo, fulfilling the promise she made to the Mother of God more than 25 years ago. She leads a humble life of piety and prayer and works tirelessly to bring lost souls back to God's light. She helps out in the parish, where she faithfully and patiently answers the questions of hundreds of pilgrims and reporters. The Holy Virgin asked her to remain in Cabejo to pray and offer her suffering, and Anathalie told me that unless Our Lady tells her to, she will never leave. And on Friday, June 29, 2001, Bishop Augustin Misago of the Diocese of Gikongoro issued his final report and verdict on the Cabejo apparitions. Before we get to the theories and the faith and reason perspectives, we'd like to take a moment to thank our patrons who make the show possible, including Heather C., Kevin G., Colleen R., Derek F., and James B. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World and all the shows at StarQuest. You can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part by Catechism Class, a dynamic weekly podcast journey through the Catechism of the Catholic Church by Greg and Jennifer Willits. It's the best book club, coffee talk, and faith study group all rolled into one. Find it in any podcast directory. What theories do we need to consider about the apparition at Cabejo? As always, we need to look at the possibilities of both natural and supernatural explanations. On the natural side, we need to consider whether the apparitions could be the product of innocent imagination, whether they were the product of mental illness, or whether they were the result of a deliberate fraud. On the supernatural side, we need to consider whether they could be demonic in origin, or whether they were genuine revelations from God. So what can we say about the reported apparitions of Our Lady of Cabejo from the reason perspective? One key source here is the report of Bishop Misago. As we discussed last episode, it was actually conducted under two bishops because Cabejo was originally part of the Diocese of Butare, so the investigation was initiated by Bishop Gahamani of Batare, but then it was handed off to Bishop Misago when the new Diocese of Gikongoro was founded. Both bishops were involved from the beginning to the end. Uh, when it began, Bishop Misago was an abbot in the Diocese of Butare, and Bishop Gahamani appointed him to the Commission of Inquiry. He also was an eyewitness of some of the events. Then, when the new diocese was set up, Bishop Misago continued to have Bishop Gahamani participate in the investigation. And even though the final report was in issued under Bishop Misago's authority, both bishops were intimately familiar with the case and we're in agreement on the conclusions. What do you make of the final report? I'm really glad we have it. Compared with some similar reports I've seen, it's quite informative, and it's almost 12,000 words long in English. We'll have a link so you can read it for yourself. It's also important to realize its value because a lot of what you hear about different apparitions are rumors and exaggerations, either from enthusiasts who look at an apparition in an uncritical manner or by opponents who look at it in an overly critical manner. 
That's why the church tasks bishops with being objective investigators of private revelations that are reported in their diocese, and why they frequently report commissions of experts, such as doctors, psychologists, and theologians, to look into what's being reported and carefully evaluate what's happening. This is the church's equivalent of a paranormal field investigation. And before a bishop gives his approval to an apparition, he sends his findings to the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith in Rome to make sure that Rome is satisfied that a competent investigation has been done and the church won't be embarrassed by a botched job if the whole thing turns out to be a fraud or due to mental illness or something. So this is a careful process. Speaking from the reason perspective, what did the bishop find? One of the things he did was draw a distinction between what happened with the three original seers and the ones who came later. He concluded that there was a qualitative difference between the original three and everybody else. He writes, From the month of May 1982, this phenomenon spread outside the microcosmos of the College of Cabejo like a bushfire reaching the surrounding hills and even the most rural areas. What is, a, what is striking is that the number of visionaries within the college stopped at the number of three without the intervention of any external authority. On the contrary, the number of people outside the college claiming to be visionaries continued growing in a rather fast and troublesome way. From July 1982, about seven months after the beginning of the apparitions of the Virgin Mary, rumors abounded about people having seen apparitions of Jesus. As time passed, however, the suspected visionaries of Jesus, prominent among the pilgrims coming to Cabejo, developed a rather disturbing way of promoting their visions. And this was one of the things that led him to decide against these additional reported visionaries. The phenomenon of the proliferation of people claiming to be visionaries continued to spread within the area of Cabejo and all across the country, misleading many pilgrims as well as persons responsible for the monitoring of these events. Well-intentioned credulousness and an excess of respect for the religiousness of people appear to have contributed in one way or another to the proliferation of pretenders. There were even cases of people frequenting certain parts of the country to spread the so-called celestial messages without the accord of the competent ecclesiastical authority. They left their own families to get hosted in convents and other religious communities. From there, they went to harass the civil and religious authorities with the messages they pretended to have received from heaven. From time to time, they presented themselves at Cabejo. Many people were troubled by these messages, consisting of simple banalities or troubling and confusing predictions. Some of these visionaries were said to have been given a special mission by Jesus and the Virgin Mary to proclaim their message abroad, especially in the neighboring countries, but also in Europe or in North America, more specifically in Canada. But both Bishop Gahamani and Bishop Misago were unpersuaded and refused to authorize any of these claimed missions. And the additional visionaries continued to cause problems after the civil war and the genocide. The faithful strongly expressed their need to know what to finally follow, especially because of all the self-appointed visionaries that still continued to spread suspicious and confusing messages all over the place, even after the fratricidal war and the genocide had barely ended. These circumstances created a climate of confusion in the church. Some communities faced religious disorder, which meant a serious risk of getting diverted from true Christian piety. Sects and new religious movements within, with Christian backgrounds blossomed. All these developments after the war ultimately contributed to more or less deliberately destabilizing the church. In short, it's high time to separate the good grain from the ryegrass. And so, in his final report, Bishop Misago declared, Only the three initial testimonies merit being considered authentic. So, just the original three not the others, which is why we haven't discussed their stories. Do the other claim visionaries still have supporters? They do, and Immaculate Ilibagiza is one of them. In her book, she endorses both the original three visionaries and five others for a total of eight. Her book is really good in most respects. It's a vivid and compelling read, and so interested listeners should get it, but they will need to use critical thinking because her endorsement of these unapproved visionaries is problematic. Does she acknowledge that the bishop didn't approve them? She does, but 
she minimizes this fact, writing, Bishop Augustine Misago made the announcement declaring the apparitions of the original three visionaries from Kibeho High School, Alphonsine, Anathalie, and Marie Claire, to be authentic. The messages received by the other visionaries and the apparitions of Jesus could be re-examined in further detail and perhaps approved in the future. This distorts what the bishop said. He did not say that he had concluded the three original visionaries were authentic and that the others could be re-examined in further detail and perhaps approved in the future. That's just unsupported speculation on her part. And it's a form of speculation that's common among enthusiasts of unapproved apparitions. They, the common approach is to downplay or ignore what a bishop has actually said, and instead say that the favorite apparitions haven't been approved yet, while intimidating that they will or should be. It's not technically impossible that such a future investigation could be done, but it is not responsible to hold out hope for it and act as if the church has not passed judgment on this matter. In the first place, it's been 40 years since the visionaries started appearing, and they were looked into as part of the original investigation process, and they were rejected. It is scarcely likely that, at this late date, any new investigation would be launched. It's also implausible that it would come to a different conclusion, because the first thing any new commission would do would be to look at the previous evaluations, which found the other seers not credible. The report says that the others promoted their visions in disturbing ways— It says they misled people. It describes them more than once as being pretenders. It says they undertook missions within the country without the accord of the church authorities, meaning over the authorities' objections. It says that they left their presumably impoverished families for personal advantage to get hosted in convents and religious communities. It says they harassed the civil and religious authorities. It says that people were troubled by their messages, some of which consisted of banalities or troubling and confusing predictions. It says some said they'd been given special missions from heaven that would involve them getting out of the country. It says they continued to spread suspicious and confusing messages all over the place, even after the fratricidal war and the genocide had barely ended. It says they created a climate of confusion in the church, and that as a result, some communities faced religious disorder. It says that they contributed to deliberately destabilizing the church, and it describes them as ryegrass that needs to be separated from the good grain with the bishop authoritatively pronouncing the judgment that only the three initial testimonies merit being considered authentic. That's not a lack of a verdict on the additional seers. That's a negative judgment. It is simply misleading to downplay this and say that the bishop approved the initial three seers and that the messages received by the other visionaries and the apparitions of Jesus could be re-examined in further detail and perhaps approved in the future. So you'll need to use critical thinking when reading Immaculate's book. For example, you'll need to keep track as you read of what visionary something is being attributed to and what the bishop's judgment on that visionary was. You'll also need to watch out for certain particular things that the book discusses. In fact, I would recommend that you read the bishop's report first so that you know what you need to look out for. For example, the book talks about miracles being seen in the sky, but the church investigation concluded, There was more than one visionary, after the three now approved, who pretended to see some astrophysical phenomena at Cabejo, trying to impress the crowds of pilgrims, particularly in November 1982, after 5 p.m. We cannot attach probative value to that. There were no miracles. Various credible witnesses gave a natural explanation for these phenomena, which seem to have been well-prepared and can be disregarded. Similarly, Immaculate says, I hope my words will convince some of you to make that special pilgrimage. Perhaps when you do, the money will have been found to build the basilica Our Lady requested. Only the request for a basilica, a particularly important kind of church building that has to be declared a basilica by the Pope, 
was only a rumor. The final report states, We must recognize that the talk of the visionaries with the Virgin Mary didn't contain the word basilica at all. Our Lady rather talked about a chapel. The concept of the basilica is a totally strange element in the true message of Cabejo. None of the three approved visionaries has ever used this word. The idea comes instead from a book on the Cabejo apparitions published in February 1983 and distributed free of charge in some places. And the local bishop has supported the building of a chapel in Cabejo, like the Virgin Mary is reported to have requested from the three visionaries. But the bishop still has people demanding that a chapel isn't enough and a bigger, more impressive basilica must be built, even though only the pope can declare a church a basilica. Understandably, this has caused frustration. Let's set aside the rumors and the other reported visionaries and look at the original three. Could all that they reported be the product of innocent imagination? Anytime a person thinks that they have a revelation from God, simple imagination needs to be considered. But it isn't likely in this case. Even if the three girls innocently imagined all the visions they reported of the Virgin Mary, it wouldn't explain why they didn't react to other people during the visions, like when people stuck needles into them or under their fingernails. Uh, you can go back and listen to last episode for a description of the kind of tests that people made of whether they were genuinely in another state of consciousness or not. And the evidence is that they were. The physical tests, some of which were really harsh, even excessively harsh, would have snapped anybody out of an innocent daydream of having a vision. What about the possibility that they were mentally ill or and their mental illness was what caused them not to react when people tested them? That's one of the things the Bishop's Medical Commission was tasked with looking into, and they didn't find evidence that any of the three original seers had visions as a result of mental illness, much less that all three of them were having visions as a result of mental illness. If they had been, their visions would never have been approved. What about the possibility of fraud? Could the seers have been colluding with each other to pull off a hoax? It's not logically impossible, but the evidence is against it. The hoax would have had to involve collusion between all three girls, and the three were not a cl close associates before the apparitions began, making it unlikely that they would have colluded together to create a hoax. If you're going to perpetrate a hoax involving multiple people, you need to make sure they're people you can trust. After all, if you initiate the hoax with people you can't trust, you run a serious risk of one or more of them immediately exposing you, leaving you out in the cold, publicly humiliated, and likely getting you punished or expelled. And that in a country where educational opportunities are difficult to come by, precious to have, and the key to a better life. So you'd only turn to close, trustworthy friends to come in with you on a hoax. And the three didn't fit that description. Alphonsine was known as a poor student. Anathalie was one of the most pious girls in the school. And Marie Claire was extremely popular and repeatedly voted class president. And she also was the chief persecutor of the first two girls. Why would any of them, and especially Marie Claire, risk what they had by going in on such a hoax with people she wasn't even close to? Then there's the question of what they would have been hoping to gain. Exactly. And it would have had to have been something of considerable value to put all that at risk. As we discussed in episode 84 on how the church evaluates private revelations, one of the things the church looks for is whether the seers attempt to profit from their revelations. It also looks at whether they can return to a healthy Christian life after the apparitions are over. In this case, the seers didn't try to get rich, and they did go on to lead healthy Christian lives. Alphonsine became a nun. Anathalie, even though she is a famous seer who could go elsewhere, give talks, and get rich, at least by Rwandan standards, gave a promise to Mary to remain in the poor village of Cabejo, where she still lives today, leading a life of prayer and helping out at the local parish. And Marie Claire fulfilled her promise to spread the Seven Sorrows Rosary. She also got married and moved to Kigali, where she tried to save her husband when the two of them were murdered during the genocide. So given all this, we don't have good evidence for a hoax. 
what can we say about Our Lady of Cabejo from the faith perspective? We've eliminated the plausible natural explanations, but do we have positive evidence that would point to the apparitions involving something supernatural? There are several things one can point to that are mentioned in the bishop's report. In fact, he has quite a number of positive evidences he mentions, uh, but here we'll look at some of the ones that have the most direct bearing on whether something supernatural happened here. First, as a sign of credibility, the bishop points to the spiritual fruit already borne by these events all across the country and even abroad. And this is one of the criteria they always look for. If God is going to go out of his way to do something extraordinary, like giving a special revelation to help draw people to himself, you want to check and see if it did so. The language the church uses for that is, did it bear spiritual fruit? In other words, did it actually draw people to God? This isn't an infallible proof, because people can get fired up about their faith and move closer to God for all kinds of reasons, even if reports of an apparition turn out to have a purely natural explanation. But it is evidence that God's grace is working in a situation if people are drawing closer to him. And in this case, the bishop notes that people did draw closer to God as a result of these apparitions, both across Rwanda and even in other countries. Also, the seers seemed to display preternatural knowledge. One of the things they seemed to know about was the coming genocide, and one of the pieces of evidence the bishop cites is frightening visions of August 15, 1982, which proved to be prophetic due to the human dramas in Rwanda and throughout the country of the Great Lakes region in recent years. This also isn't irrefutable proof, since you could propose that the schoolgirls had a natural sense that the ethnic tensions in Rwanda would one day lead to genocide, but the country had not experienced violence on this scale ever before, and certainly not in the lifetime of the girls. And it kind of gets your attention when the visionaries are seeing rivers of blood and heaps of mangled bodies, and within a few years there are literal rivers of blood and hundreds of thousands of mangled bodies in heaps. Another thing that the girls seemed to have preternatural knowledge of was the Seven Sorrows Rosary. The bishop explains, The Rosary of the Seven Sorrows of the Virgin Mary is part of the relatively old tradition of Marian devotion in the order of Friar Servants of Mary, Servites. There was a time before the 1960s when this rosary was e known even in Rwanda, but only in the circle of the Benepikira sisters. It was introduced by Mama Teresa Kamagisha, the first Rwandese general superior of the congregation. Since the end of her mandate, however, this rosary was poorly accepted by the sisters and slid into obscurity. It was the visionary Marie Claire Mukangongo who brought it back again as she received the mission to teach the Rosary of the Seven Sorrows by the Blessed Virgin Mary of Cabejo. After intensive research, the ad hoc commissions have still not found any evidence that Marie Claire knew this rosary before the beginning of the apparitions. Now, even though it was not widely known in Rwanda, it it's possible that Marie Claire had heard about this type of rosary, and maybe she'd forgotten about it in a case of cryptoamnesia, and then it bubbled up in her subconscious. But the bishop says the commissions did intensive research and couldn't find any evidence that Marie Claire had known about this rosary. It looks like this was a piece of preternatural knowledge she received in her visions. Finally, there's a piece of physical evidence that the bishop cites, which was an extraordinary act of fasting that Anathali, the second seer, performed. The bishop thus cites, The extraordinary fasting of Anathali during Lenten season 1983, rigorously monitored by the medical commission, whose members did not consist of practicing Catholics only. Unfortunately, I don't have more information about this fasting, so I can't use my own knowledge and experience of fasting to evaluate it. However, the bishop indicates that the medical commission, which included doctors who were not practicing Catholics, monitored an athlete as she fasted and concluded it that it was something extraordinary. So in the absence of natural explanations and a variety of positive indications that something supernatural was happening, that's a logical conclusion. Could the apparitions be of demonic origin? 
We discussed the criteria needed to diagnose demonic involvement back in episode 188, so people can go back and re-listen to that if they wish. But the criteria were not met in this case. The three girls were not possessed. Instead, they were seen to be having conversations with Mary, speaking on behalf of their own personalities talking to her. They did not display an aversion to sacred things. Indeed, they were positively attracted to sacred things like churches and sacraments and prayer. And they did not teach things that were contrary to the faith. Instead, the theological commission that investigated them found that their messages were consistent with the faith and called attention to important aspects of it. Doctrinal accuracy is, of course, one of the key things the church looks for when evaluating private apparitions. And attributing doctrinal error to God or the Virgin Mary or whoever is appearing to you is first on the list of negative criteria that will get an apparition rejected. Also, the goal of demons is to pull people away from God. So if they inspire a bunch of apparitions and they end up bearing spiritual fruit and on an international scale even, then these demons are really bad at doing their job. It looks more like God's grace is at work. So no good evidence of the demonic. If we eliminate the demonic from the supernatural explanations available, that would leave us with the option of them being authentic apparitions of the Virgin Mary. It would, but there's more to say. For example, one of the things that the bishop was careful to do here, as bishops always do in documents giving approval to apparitions, is to clarify their status relative to the faith. As you'd expect, he points out that the approval decision is not an infallible one. The recognition or negation of the authenticity of an apparition does not guarantee infallibility. It is based on proofs of probability more than on indisputable arguments. Therefore, there is no absolute certainty for the witnesses of the apparitions that they actually took place, except for the visionaries themselves. This is one reason why, unlike the public revelation we find in the Bible, apparitions today are only private revelations and are not binding on everyone. The bishop writes, The church is aware that the positive revelation that God wanted to communicate to his people for the sake of their salvation was brought to a close with the death of the last apostle, St. John the Evangelist, author of the book of Revelation. Everything necessary for our salvation is already contained in the Holy Scriptures and in the living tradition of the church. And even though the most precious visions can raise our passion anew, they don't really provide any new elements of divine life or knowledge. Strictly speaking, there are therefore no new revelations to wait for. However, this does not mean that God wouldn't continue to personally intervene in the lives of people. An approved private apparition that strengthens faith and prayer in the life of a member of the faithful certainly is a powerful help to the shepherds of his flock. The message associated with this apparition, however, won't be a new revelation, but rather a reminder of the common teaching of the church. So visions like those that happened at Cabejo are not meant to teach new doctrines. The Christian faith is already complete. And the bishop warns against treating the words of a private visionary as if they were Holy Scripture, because they're not. It is not a good thing for the words of those who consider themselves visionaries, even if they are officially recognized, to be treated equally with the words of the Holy Scriptures. However, apparitions can call people's attention to existing teachings that they need to implement in their lives, like the need to repent and grow closer to God. They also can serve as warnings about things people need to look out for in their own times. In the history of the Church, approved apparitions have often been an alarm signal, an invitation for the whole world to convert. Their role was to awaken the dozing consciences so that they might wait alert for the coming of Christ. So apparitions can provide warnings, including warnings like, if you don't repent and start loving your neighbors, there will be a genocide. If private revelations like this aren't meant to communicate new doctrines, how does that relate to the mystical journeys that two of the visionaries went on, seeing parts of the invisible world? These journeys don't present us with new doctrines that the faithful are bound to believe. Instead, they're a way of presenting things we already know about, like heaven, hell, and purgatory. The bishop explains it this way. First, Alphonsine Mumareke, and then Anathali Mukamazimpaka, 
said they had made a mystical journey together with the Virgin Mary for several hours, traveling through places which they described in a symbolic language, reminding us of realities such as hell, purgatory, and heaven, but using vocabulary different from that of the Catechism. So these visions presented things we already knew about, just in a different and symbolic way. Even though the bishop's decision is not infallible, does it mean that people are required to believe that these were authentic apparitions? No, one can be a perfectly good Catholic and disagree. If you think that the evidence points to some other explanation, you're perfectly free to arrive at that conclusion. The bishop writes, There is no need to exaggerate the importance of a formal approval of the apparitions. An approval like this is not infallible. It is only proposed for all the good reasons there are to approve these apparitions. The church authorities, however, do not oblige anyone to believe in the apparitions, for neither of the decisions made in this field is a dogma of faith. Therefore, nobody should ever claim the right to impose their own beliefs on others or substitute their own beliefs for the doctrine of the magisterium of the church. Every Christian is to show respect for those who believe in the apparitions. So people who believe the apparitions were authentic should respect those who don't, and vice versa. People should not be drawing up sides and judging each other over this. There should be mutual respect. The bishop also has some additional pieces of advice, such as keeping your focus on Jesus. In Christian faith and prayer, one should be watchful in order to ensure priority is Jesus Christ, the only mediator between God and men. It is about him that the Holy Scriptures speak. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. No creation can be placed above Jesus Christ, the only Savior of the world. In this context, I find it suitable to strongly emphasize the meaning of the bond that should exist between Mary and devotion and an ever greater attachment to Jesus. Mary leads us to him, for he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through him. So, despite how awesome Jesus' mother is, she's only a creature, and we need to keep our focus on Jesus, the uncreated Son of God. The bishop also warns against taking a superstitious approach to religious devotions, which can sometimes happen with devotions connected to private apparitions. We should be careful not to liken religious practices to rites that border on magic, as though by our words or actions we could force God to fulfill our desires. It is certain that we must pray, ask, and seek, just as our Lord himself directs us. But we can never forget that God is completely free in giving his gifts, and we cannot impose on him our desires or, more specifically, our wills. He gives as he pleases and at the moment he considers appropriate. Through this systemization of these notions, I want to warn those making pilgrimage to Cabejo against the danger of a certain magical mentality that can get mixed up with good intentions when they come into contact with visionaries or ask for the blessing of water or devotional items. So we can benefit from apparitions like the authentic ones from Cabejo, and the bishop recommends devotions connected with them, such as the Seven Sorrows Rosary and making pilgrimages to the chapel there. But we should keep our focus on Jesus and not be superstitious. Is there anything else we should say before we go? Because this story involved a horrible tragedy, the genocide that killed almost a million people and that has left scars on Rwandan society, I want to request that we pray for everybody involved, both the persecutors and the persecuted, including Marie Claire and her husband, who lost their lives in the genocide. As Pope Benedict XVI pointed out, God is not limited by earthly time, and it is never too late to pray for people. So let's pray for everyone involved in the situation, both living and dead. And let's pray that God gives us the grace and that we use our free will to love our neighbors so that things like this don't happen in the future. Jimmy, what's your bottom line on the mystery of Our Lady of Cabejo? The natural explanations for the apparitions of the three original seers do not work well. As a result of that, and the positive indications that they were of supernatural origin, the most likely conclusion is that these visions were supernatural. In the absence of evidence that they were of demonic origin, the logical conclusion is that they were exactly what they appeared to be, authentic visions that God granted the three seers of the Virgin Mary. 
They were meant to call people to love and devotion of God and to warn them of what would happen if people did not repent and abandon hatred in favor of love of neighbor. Unfortunately, too few heeded the call and the prophecy genocide happened. We can be grateful that it didn't go further than it did, and we can pray for those involved and that we love each other enough to prevent things like that from happening in the future. Agreed. So, Jimmy, what further resources can we offer to the listener and viewer on this topic? We'll have a link, once again, to our special sponsor for this episode, and uh, the link where you can learn more and donate is sqpn.com slash help Africa. That's sqpn.com slash help Africa. We'll also have links to Immaculee Ilibagiza's book, Our Lady of Cabejo. Also, her book, Left to Tell, Discovering God Amidst the Rwandan Holocaust, which is an autobiographical book about what she experienced. We'll have a link to Philip uh, Gurevich's book, We Wish to Inform You That Tomorrow We Will Be Killed With Our Families stories from Rwanda. And uh, this book, as I mentioned last week, is uh, uh, an account of the Rwandan genocide. And the title of the book is an excerpt from a letter that was sent by a group of ministers who were going to be killed to like the leader of their denomination. And the title is really self-explanatory. We wish to inform you that tomorrow we will be killed with our families. Wow. Um, We'll also have a link to the full text of the Bishop's Declaration so that you can read that. And like I said, I recommend you read that first. We'll also have a link to the Vatican's document on evaluating private revelations. Uh, We'll have some pages from Miracle Hunter on the apparitions. Also, a summary. Uh, If you don't want to read all 12,000 words, there's a shorter summary of the Bishop's uh, Declaration. We'll have information in general on Our Lady of Cabejo, a short video about the apparitions you can watch, also uh, uh, information about the 1994 Rwandan genocide, the Seven Sorrows Rosary. We'll have both background information on it and a devotional guide so you can pray it yourself, as well as further information on the Rwandan Revolution, the Rwandan Civil War, the Rwandan Genocide, and Juvenile, the president of Rwanda who was assassinated, Juvenile Habyarimana. Excellent. So that brings us to our mysterious feedback. And as I mentioned, this is going to be more feedback on our two-part episodes on on Noah's Ark and the Great Flood. Uh, before we get started, I want to remind listeners and viewers that you can send in your feedback via our mysterious feedback line, and we could have your audio feedback played during a future episode. And our feedback line is 619-738-4515. So, Jimmy, we're going to be doing Mysterious Feedback a little differently this episode than we normally do. How will it be different? Well, uh, we have feedback from two listeners here, and um, just two this time, because one of them is is quite lengthy. The first one makes a point that I think is really great, and the second one is uh, is long, but it touched my heart in a special way, and I want to have the chance to interact with it. So I'll let you read it, and I'll occasionally stop and comment. Okay, so the first feedback comes from Al Williams on YouTube, who writes, To the authors of Genesis, the physical geological evidence of seashells on the tops of mountains would be proof enough for them to hypothesize that indeed there must have been a true flood over all the mountaintops. Moreover, the finding of huge skulls and rib bones of giant creatures such as dinosaurs and mammoths would lead them to understand the truth that the prehistoric world must have been very different than their current world proved itself to be. These authors in some ways were the first scientists and were giving their best opinion on how seashells and monstrous skulls with giant teeth could empirically end up on mountaintops. If they had no concept of plate tectonics, they might have been left with the only common sense conclusion that there must have been a flood so great that the seas covered the mountaintops at one time, thus allowing shellfish to live there. I think Al makes a really outstanding point here. Uh, For a person in the ancient world, if you're up on a mountaintop and you find seashells, fossilized seashells that have turned to stone, and if you find, um, you know, the skulls and other bones of giant monsters uh, and you have sea monsters in your cultural background, which the Israelites did, and especially if you find, you know, like ichthyosaur bones, 
um, which is, you know, this is a sea creature um, or other fish bones, the logical conclusion would be, well, these bones had to get up here on this mountain somehow. What would do that? Well, a flood would. And so the idea of a flood covering the mountains would be a very logical conclusion. And this would be an example of early scientific reasoning. So I, I want to compliment the ancients for thinking of that and Al for pointing it out. And then our second feedback comes from Ian B on YouTube, who writes, Thanks for doing this topic, Jimmy. The question of how to interpret the first 11 chapters of Genesis, and the Great Flood in particular, is something I've really struggled with my entire adult life as I became more familiar with the relevant information from science. I was brought up being taught in school, church, and a family member that a young earth creation literalistic account was both factual and basically essential to Christianity. As a result, I've been racked for decades by a deep-seated, visceral anxiety when approaching the whole topic that has often tormented me to the point of depression and keeps me from being able to look at it objectively or to keep it in perspective. It's difficult for me to think about various interpretations without a fear in the back of my mind that I'm calling God a liar and that I will lose my faith and my salvation or become the sort of liberal Christian who thinks the resurrection is just a feel-good allegory of some sort. And I also struggle with how to teach my own children about these things, since I have such a hard time approaching them myself, particularly my son, who's very smart and inquisitive. So for these reasons, it's incredibly helpful for, to me to have someone like you, who is a faithful Orthodox Christian that I respect enormously, walk through these issues. It also helps that you're a former member of my denomination, the PCA or Presbyterian Church in America, though I've long thought about whether I should swim the Tiber because many of the apologists and philosophers that have been most helpful to me are Catholic. I may have my son watch this episode and the next one. There are a couple of remaining sticking points in particular that I have that maybe you could help me through. Okay, and before we get to those, I just want to say that I really appreciate what Ian is saying here. Um, I was fortunate and I, I'm, I was fortunate in that I was raised in a family that had a healthy respect for science. I w unfortunately, we were not practicing Christians. Um, we were nominal Christians, and so I didn't get as much of the I didn't get the faith perspective. But then when I acquired the faith perspective, it was in a conservative evangelical context. And like Ian mentions, I was a member of the Presbyterian Church in America, which is a conservative Presbyterian denomination. And so I, as a young adult, had to take on the struggle with these issues. And what I can say is that there's nothing to be afraid of. Um, I know there's a kind of slippery slope worry of if I start down this, if I concede anything to the modern scientific perspective, will that completely gut my faith? And the answer is no. I mean, for, it, it, there's no reason it should. Um, as someone who takes both faith and science very seriously, if you just trust the word of people who've made the journey that, yeah, there are resolutions and it doesn't undermine the faith. And yes, Jesus really was resurrected. Um, then you can have confidence to be more open to looking at some of the more complex issues of how do we fit these different puzzle pieces together? Because ultimately, as St. Thomas Aquinas pointed out, all truth is God's truth. So if something, if we have evidence scientifically that something is true, we should take that seriously. If we have biblical evidence that something is true, we need to take that seriously. But in both cases, with scientific evidence and a biblical text, we need to recognize that our interpretation of it may be simplistic. And so uh, this is a constant problem in science. It's one of our scientific theories are only approximations. They are only ever approximations of what happened. And that's why science continues to progress as we, uh, as we get additional evidence that doesn't quite fit the current theory and it needs to be revised over time. And the same thing is true with interpretation of scripture because we are not each little infallible interpreters. And so while God's word is there, we're not always understanding it correctly. And so we need to be open to, uh, to thinking about, well, could there be another interpretation or other interpretations, plural, 
besides the ones that first strike me as obvious? Could there be some less obvious interpretations that might turn out to be the true one? Because as God himself tells us in Scripture, my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. And if God is trying to communicate with a Bronze Age people or Iron Age people, you can expect him to simplify and to use the literary artistry that's available in that culture to communicate his truth. And then when we, coming at it from a culture that is much more literal and um, has a very different way of conceptualizing nature, there are going to be mismatches between our understanding of things and how God would have communicated it to the ancient audience. And so um, for what it's worth, I mean, I've made this journey of, um, of integrating faith and science. I continue to study both of them and I am not threatened by this. They, you don't have to be worried that if you're, if you start, you know, investigating these subjects that you're going to lose your faith. There is no reason that needs to happen. And then Ian continues, on the one hand, I realize that there are parts of the story that we must regard as figurative. For instance, we can't believe that God literally regretting, regretted making ha- humankind or that he needs the rainbow as a reminder not to kill humanity, because that would directly contradict what we know from both the rest of scripture and philosophy and theology that God is eternal, unchanging, does not have a body, upholds all of the existence at all times, and has worked out his divine plan of salvation from all eternity. Hence, he can't literally regret anything or forget anything. Similarly, God couldn't literally have needed to come down to see the construction of the Tower of Babel, or literally have made a habit of walking in the breeze. And later scripture reveals that the serpent in Genesis 3 was Satan, even though the text in Genesis doesn't say that though clearly something much more than a regular old snake is intended there. And I would argue that the author clearly intends for your seed slash her seed to connect to the good and evil lines of Abel and Seth and Cain. On the other hand, I have a hard time believing that that ancient Israelites were not meant to see the covenant of Noah as being a real covenant, or that we aren't supposed to see it as a real part of salvation history. But how are we to regard that covenant in the case that the Great Flood was a local or regional event or a metaphorical one that doesn't refer to a specific event? In that case, is the covenant real? And if so, does it apply to all of us or only to those on the ark or only to the ancient Israelites? So um, the answer is there are a number of possibilities here. One, uh, if is, and we talked about some of this a little bit last episode in the feedback section, but um, one possibility is Noah's a is is a historical figure. He's some survivor of a flood, and God appeared and made a special covenant with him. That's that's not precluded by anything we know from reason. So that's that's possible. It is also possible that um, that. It's not meant to be taken as a strictly historical thing, but what the biblical author is affirming fundamentally, the point that the biblical author is making, and thus the point that the Holy Spirit is guaranteeing to be true, is that God is never going to destroy mankind with a flood in the future. That's the fundamental point. And so even when we see floods, even if they're big, God's never going to let it happen that all of mankind will be wiped out in a flood. And so um, uh, the, the you know, biblical audience may have, um, you know, based on the their understanding of the traditions they had received, they may have thought, okay, well, something like this happened once, but the fundamental point that's being made is you don't have to worry about this happening in the future. And whether there was a specific supernatural manifestation where God, you know, gave Noah a, a, a revelation and said, I'm never going to do this, um, whether or not there was a specific historical moment where that happened, it is just true, and God's revelation affirms that we will never have the destruction of mankind by a flood in the future. And then Ian continues, one thought I had was that perhaps while the great flood was local, the covenant that God made with the survivors in some way applies to all of us, and even to creation itself, since God's plan of salvation history runs through him. This would be analogical to how we are all children of Abraham. 
I'm not sure I'm completely comfortable with this idea, but I thought I'd put it out there. I think that the text in Genesis is meant to uh, to govern all of humanity going forward with regard to there's not going to be a flood that wipes everybody out. Um, so I think you're on the right track there. Uh, he continues, also, I know you addressed this briefly already in your video, but some of the New Testament references to the flood do seem to be very difficult to me to square with a purely metaphorical interpretation, more so than even Jesus' own reference to, references to it. For instance, 2 Peter cites it among other historical examples as proof that God will rescue the righteous and punish the wicked, and Hebrews lists Noah among the list of saints in salvation history we should look up to, right along with others who are unambiguously historical. I'd add that the same holds for other characters in early Genesis that are mentioned in the New Testament. For instance, does Jesus saying that Abel's blood cries out still imply that Abel was at least partly historical? Okay, let's talk about that. Um, so it's true that in Hebrews chapter 11, there is a list of famous heroes of the faith, including Noah, and lessons that we can learn from their lives, principally, have faith, duh. Um, and in Second Peter, there is a reference to Noah where Peter is cataloging a series of events that we read about in, uh, especially in the early part of the uh, of Genesis, and you know some other stuff as well. But he is cataloging these events, and I think that the um, the solution there involves the principle that you mentioned that I talked about in the previous episode of saying, what is the author really trying to assert here? Um, and in neither case is he asserting that these are literal historical figures. Instead, he is the author of Hebrews is asserting you need to have faith. And Peter is asserting that you need to do the things that will avoid punishment by God. And so those are the points under discussion. And when we then uh, look at how do the passages they're thinking of from the Old Testament, or even in the case of the author of, of Hebrews, some extra biblical traditions, how do, how do those um, relate and support the point they're making? I think it's fair to say that, you know, when they're when these two authors are thinking of the early chapters of Genesis, they are thinking of, okay, here we have this text, and it conveys God's word, which it does, and thus it conveys truth, which it does, and I can cite that truth in support of the point I need to make, which they can. What is a question is... Um, and similarly, let me, uh, this will help if I bring this up now. Um, just like Jesus's parables are God's word, and they convey truth, and they sometimes even incorporate elements of historical events, like the uh, the parable of um, of the Minas in in Luke's gospel, where you have the king that goes overseas to receive a kingdom and it comes back. Well, that is a reference to the um, to one of the Herods who had to go over to Rome to be confirmed as king by the Roman Senate and thus receive a kingdom. So Jesus is even incorporating elements of historical events in parabolic material. And nevertheless, that parabolic material conveys truths because it's God's word, and you can cite what's in Jesus's parables in support of some other point that you're making. So it doesn't matter whether the text is literal history or if it's something other than literal history. It's still God's word. It still conveys truth, and you can use it to support further points. There's then a question of, well, what degree of awareness does a biblical author have of the nature of the text he's reading? He may assume that it's historical when it's not, or he may assume it's not historical when it is, but in divine inspiration doesn't guarantee the assumptions that a biblical author is making. Divine in 
in inspiration guarantees the results of what he writes, not his own background assumptions, because these were ancient peoples. These were ancient authors. They did not have a modern understanding of the world. They had some very different background assumptions, and the, the Holy Spirit is not guaranteeing that their background assumptions are right. So in the same way, um, it doesn't necessarily the Holy Spirit doesn't necessarily guarantee that the biblical authors are in their are assuming the right thing about the nature of early Genesis, about the degree of literal versus literariness it has. Um, but it, the Holy Spirit does guarantee, divine inspiration guarantees, that the application they make from those texts is correct. So that's how I would look at that. It, I, I pick, um, you know, like Jesus's parables as obvious cases of literary artistry that are not meant to be historical, but there's actually a spectrum here. And, um, and there can be cases where, like in some of Jesus's parables, they're not really incorporating anything historical, but in others, like the one I mentioned, there is something historical, and there can be additional texts that incorporate more elements of history, but that still are less than fully historical. And I would tend to put early, early Genesis in that category. All right. And then he continues, from a scientific perspective, I know it's very hard to find any point in history since the appearance of biblical man, for example, those who show the clear possession of reason and intellect and capacity to know God, etc., perhaps around 60,000 to 100,000 years ago, that a local flood could have literally wiped out all of humanity since we see biblical man spread around the globe from probably around 50,000 years ago. On the other hand, I've always had a very difficult time buying into the idea that the eerily similar Great Flood legends from most cultures all over the world can plausibly be accounted for purely by the fact that floods have happened a lot in history rather than any sort of shared cultural memory. My own current view is that there likely was a massive flood that was multi-regional, even if not global, that it affected large swaths of humanity, even if it didn't wipe out all but a single family, and that it happened early enough in history that subsequent migrations resulted in different versions of the story being shared by different cultures globally, perhaps in the 10,000 to 20,000 years ago range as the Ice Age was ending, so that there is a genuine worldwide cultural memory of the event. Under this view, the biblical version of the Great Flood is most similar to other versions from the Near East because it did indeed draw from the motifs of the surrounding cultures, and likely also because they most closely correspond to how the Flood was experienced by people living in that area. Yet it also corrected the record by giving the truth about who the divinity behind the Flood was and why it was sent and likely also by revealing certain things that actually happened, such as God making a covenant with the survivors. And as we mentioned, we will be, I think you're on the right track, and we will be mentioning, as I mentioned before, we will be covering the Great Flood again, and theories like, could this have been a tradition or body of traditions that came down from an event that happened at the end of the Ice Age? Uh, I think that's a very plausible uh, theory that is worth exploration. And recently, I have uh, found some good sources on very long-lived traditions, the ones that span thousands of years. Uh, without written documentation. And so as I process that, I'm going to be incorporating that and, and working towards doing future episodes on this. And then he continues, I'm also cautiously aware that the reconstruction of human prehistory that we think we know is most likely wrong in major ways, and that the history of scientific theory and consensus, when exposed to direct confirmation or disconfirmation, has been spotty at best. And by definition, all our methods and conclusions when it comes to reconstructing prehistory are beyond direct confirmation. So perhaps there is more room for a universal or new near-universal Great Flood than I think after all. Also, I become increasingly aware of just how thoroughly cosmology, history, anthropology, biology, psychology, and more have been infected by a reductionist materialist groupthink that is philosophically incoherent, but enforced by intense social pressure. And I can't help but wonder how different the received facts might look without that, especially as I see seemingly every discipline and institution of science collapsing into a deconstructionist postmodernism as a result of this ideology working itself out. And I think those are both good points. Um, the uh, 
we do need to be on guard against uh, philosophical considerations like, you know, postmodern materialist ideology affecting our read of scientific evidence. We also um, need, we also, as I've said, need to subject both our interpretation of the scientific data to critical examination and our interpretation of scripture to critical examination, because neither interpretation is guaranteed to be true, and it often turns out that our first interpretation ends up not being the one that best conforms to the evidence. And so um, we don't want to dismiss either the uh, the scientific proposals that have been made or the faith proposals that have been made. They both need, we need to use critical thinking in both cases to arrive at the best integration of the evidence. And then Ian concludes, uh, anyhow, Jimmy, if you've actually read this far, I just I wanted have. to... <laughs> we all have. I just wanted to say again how much I'm thankful for the work you do and for tackling this topic in particular. I'm sorry for rambling and thank you for bearing with me. I suspect I'm overthinking this and over obsessing, but as I said, it's been a deep source of pain and spiritual torment for me going on 25 years now. And that's I, why I wanted to cover it, because I know that it has been for other people, too, and I wanted to have the chance to interact and provide assurances in this regard. Uh, and then says, I'd appreciate any prayers you might have for me. You really are helping out people like me and dealing with the struggles we face. May Jesus Christ bless you. And may God bless you, too, Ian, and I would encourage the audience to pray for everybody who struggles with issues like this, um, because it is very common, and it's one of the things I'm trying to do here on Mysterious World is provide a way through the the um, discussion rather than shying away from it and retreating and retrenching to just one position or another. All right, and that uh, concludes our Mysterious Feedback. Jimmy, what do we have for Mysterious Headlines this week? Well, it's, uh, we'll have a link. It's not so much to a headline, but it is to something that I recently did. One of the things that I think about in doing Mysterious World is um, where the mysteries are based. You know, like uh, Cabejo, today's mystery, well, that's based in Rwanda, and Rwanda is in Africa. And I, because this is Jimmy Akin's mysterious world, not just Jimmy Akin's mysterious California or something like that, I want to be as thorough as I can in covering different places in the world. Um, now, there's always going to be certain biases. Um, in the mysteries we cover, because I'm an American, I know more about America than other places. So a lot of the mysteries will be based in America. Also, because I'm an English speaker, um, I need, I mean, I can speak bits of other languages, but it would be really slow going if I had to do my own translation, even in languages I, I know somewhat well. So I have to kind of rely on English language works. Um, to do research and especially electronic work. So there's always, even when we get outside of America, there's always going to be a bias towards um, towards uh, parts of the world that that English that they speak English in, or that English language literature is available that's about that that area of the world. Um, because I'm a Christian, you're always going to run into, there's always going to be a little bit of a bias towards Middle Eastern um, mysteries. And because I'm a Catholic Christian, there's going to be a bias towards Rome and, you know, uh, mysteries connected with that. So there are the, going to be these biases, but I want to be as comprehensive as I can. And so when I'm laying in bed at night thinking about what to schedule and what to investigate, I think, okay, I try to think my way around the world because I have a visual imagination. And so I imagine the continents and, I, and the countries, and I try to think of where have we done mysteries yet? What could I find? find in these additional areas. And I finally decided, let's make a Google map. <laughs> and so I did. I, uh, I, I, I took a bit of time and I, I used Google Maps to make a map of the world where I dropped pins for all the different mysteries we've considered so far, and I'll update it as we go along. Um, and that allows me to see where we have covered and where we haven't covered. Um, for mysteries that aren't tied to a particular location, like transhumanism was an early mystery we did, but transhumanism is not based in any one place, those mysteries get to live in the Arctic Ocean. <laughs> um, but uh, but 
other mysteries. I, I put pins at different places on the earth. And I within each pin, I also put a link to the video version of the podcast. So what you can do, we'll have a link to the map I made of Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World. And you can, you can zoom in on the map. You can scroll around on the map. You can look at, uh, at mysteries we did in different places. And you can click to watch the videos of them. And when you do that, by the way, you'll, you'll be at my YouTube channel. And I'm trying to grow that. So we're almost at 25,000 uh, subscribers. So please subscribe and hit the bell notification so you'll know when there's new videos coming up, whether they're part of Mysterious World or not. And uh, have fun with the map. And yeah. if you know about mysteries, uh, it will, like I said, it will be updated over time. And if you know about mysteries that we could cover that are elsewhere in the world, uh, by all means, let us know about them. But I need resources to do the research. So please send links to resources, especially mm -hmm. electronic resources, accurate, reliable resources to the extent you can determine that, and resources in English. But I would love to flesh out many additional places and countries besides the ones I'm already planning on. And to do that, I just need quality English material in electronic form on the mysteries that we want to look at. And we'll look at about embedding this map in the SQPN website. And uh, if you go to the uh, videos and you want an audio version, there is always a link back to the uh, SQPN page that will have an audio uh, presentation as well. So yeah, uh, that, it's a great resource. Thanks for making that, Jimmy. So we're going to wrap things up here. Uh, we want to stop uh, just briefly to make, give a special thanks to my wife, Melanie, and my daughter, Isabella, who have provided some of the readings and some of the parts in both last week's and this week's episode. So thank you to you both. And uh, we want to ask you, our listeners and viewers, what do you think about this first approved apparition in Africa, Our Lady of Cabejo, and the Rwandan genocide that followed? What are your theories? You can let us know by visiting sqpn.com or the Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World Facebook page, sending us an email to mysterious at sqpn.com, sending a tweet to at mys underscore world, or calling our mysterious feedback line at 619-738-4515. That's 619-738-4515. So, Jimmy, what's our next episode going to be about? Next week, we'll be returning to the subject of UFOs, and we'll be discussing a man named Dr. Stephen Greer, who conducts human-initiated contact sessions in which they summon UFOs, UFOs are reported to appear, be witnessed, and even be filmed by those in attendance. Hmm. Fascinating. Folks, be sure to check out the Mysterious World bookstore at mysteriousworldstore.com for links to all the books and videos that Jimmy mentions in the show. You can find links to Jimmy's resources from our discussion and links to, link to that uh, Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World map on our show notes at sqpn.com slash mysterious. And remember to help us continue to produce the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part by Fearvento Law, PLLC, specializing in adult guardianships and conservatorships, probate and estate planning matters, accepting clients throughout Michigan, taking into account your individual health care, financial, and religious needs. Visit FearventoLaw.com. F-I-O-R-V-E-N-T-O Law.com. Until next time, Jimmy Aiken, thank you for exploring with us our mysterious world. Thanks, Tom. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World on StarQuest. <laughs>